The guest today is George Massenberg. Amazing interview with an amazing individual. We did this over Skype to Montreal, Canada. Um, there was a little bit of interference with our connection this time. So please bear with us if the audio quality is not absolute tip top, but we're going to make sure that you guys can hear everything that George shared with us and not miss a word. Thanks so much for listening. See you guys in the show. Cheers. But I always heard the sound that I'm getting now. I've always heard the snare drum sound that I get today is the one that I've been chasing for 50 years. Um, I think what's different is not working on analog tape. Uh, I hated tape. I didn't like tape. Everything, only sonic muscles, only sounded like this. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. Sending your music to be mastered can be scary, but sending your music to a total stranger for mastering can be really scary. Chris Graham is a billboard chart breaking mastering engineer with thousands of credits and knows how to make your record sound fantastic. But more importantly, he understands that there is one person that really knows what a great record sounds like, and that's you, rock stars. So if you're thinking about hiring professional mastering, but not sure if it's right for you, go to chrisgrammastering.com and get a free sample mastering of your song. Go find out just how great your record can sound at chrisgrammastering.com. Just click the link included in the show notes. Hey, rock stars! it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is George Massenberg, a multi-Grammy award-winning producer, engineer, mixer, and award-winning audio designer, legendary for having invented the parametric equalizer in 1972. George has participated in over 400 records over the past 45 years. His work includes recordings of Earth, Wind & Fire, Linda Ronstadt, Little Feet, Lyle Lovett, Aaron Neville, Mary Chapin Carpenter, Herbie Hancock, Arlo Guthrie, Billy Joel, the Dixie Chicks, and many more. His studio work has gained him international recognition and four Grammys, including Grammy for Technical Achievement in 1998, at the time making him one of only 17 individuals to receive that honor, as well as numerous Mix Magazine Tech Awards. In 1988, he also won the Academy of Country Music Record of the Year Award. George has designed, built, and managed several recording studios and has contributed to the acoustical and architectural design of many other studios, including George Lucas's Skywalker Sound. And in 1982, he founded George Massenberg Labs and created an extensive range of innovative recording technologies, all based on his original designs, such as the GML 8200 parametric equalizer and the GML 8900 dynamic range controller, which reacts to loudness like our ears do rather than to voltage levels. And George pioneered mixing automation with the earliest moving faders for consoles. George was awarded an honorary doctorate of music by Berklee College of Music and received the gold medal from the Audio Engineering Society in 2008. In 2013, he was awarded a patent by the U.S. as well as other countries for a variable exponent averaging detector and dynamic range controller. He's also a member of the National Recording Preservation Board of the Library of Congress and an, adv an advisor to the Committee for Library Information Resources. George serves as the Chief Technical Officer of META, the Music Engineering Technical Alliance, a strategic union of music producers and engineers dedicated to the highest standards of audio and delivery of music. Currently, he is an associate professor of sound recording at the Skulik School of Music at McGill University in Montreal and a visiting lecturer at the Berklee College of Music in Boston and Valencia, Spain, and the University of Memphis in Memphis, Tennessee. 
That's a long intro, but please welcome George Massenberg to Recording Studio Rockstars. George, are you ready to rock? Hi, everybody. I sure am. Man, you know, before we did this interview, we were just chatting a little bit about our mutual friend, Steve Albini, who, who I believe introduced us um, for the podcast. So thank you to you, Steve. But uh, when I asked George, I mean, excuse me, when I asked Steve if he was ready to rock, he said he was born ready to rock. And I think of you <laughs> so, as somebody who created the ability for us to record and equalize rock, <laughs> among other things. Look, I've got to correct one little thing. Yeah, if please you don't mind do. Me. Um, I didn't really do the first moving tater system. That was probably NECAM. NECAM okay. 1 and NECAM 2. But I certainly built my system in response to the egregiously poor uh, performance of NECAM. And uh, I, uh, we all owe a lot to, uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We owe a lot to designers of yore, but, uh, but that was something that needed to be done a lot better. So that kind of frames my work is, is I look for things that don't work very well and try to fix them. Well, that's cool. I mean, that was some real pioneering stuff back then. And I know that it's it sort of, you know, the idea of automatable faders moving around on a console seem to represent the ultimate expression of a great studio at the time, you know? Well, either that or a great robot. <laughs> a great robot. <laughs> um, you know, and now, of course, I've got a, a little plastic controller that'll control an old Pro Tools system that has moving faders on it, and it sort of sits in the corner. But, you know, you really ushered in a thing that has become ubiquitous in studios, too, now. I mean, it's, you know, there are many... Uh, how many moving faders controllers are there these days? Oh, they're they're seemingly thousands. Uh, certainly, the one that's that's gotten the most interest from new practitioners is uh, the Artist Mix, the Euphonics Artist yeah. Mix. Yeah, Martin Kloiber's. I like Martin Kloiber. I think he's a he's a smart guy. Uh, but that's a good that's a good box, and we use them at the studio, and kids can buy them. They're also some single fader controllers that I've seen. But funnily enough, most of them are, are built on the idea of, well, not all, but most of them are built on the idea of a, a, an ironless core, a slot car, what used to be a slot car electric Ooh, motor. I liked slot cars. We used to have a great set when I was a kid. We'd rebuild the engines in the cars and, and sort of Frankenstein them. And, and uh, Mick Kozowski and I used to uh, double and triple the batteries so that they, they go like hell. They go like hell for two and a half minutes, but they go like hell um, <laughs> and run them out in the street and scare people to death behind uh, Westlake. Nice. But, the, uh, but, but the, thing, the thing, there was something important, and I don't want to let it pass by. The idea is that we're constantly innovating and, and a little bit slower to understand the impact of new technologies on art. Steve's a good guy for that because he and I are both deeply uh, uh, enmeshed, ingrained in, in old uh, original audio practices. And although Steve is drawn kicking and screaming into digital, I mean, he, he has had to, in some small ways, embrace it. And, and yeah. I'm proud of him for uh, opening his mind up when he does. I was guilty as one of those producers, um, you know, with a young band in there who insisted on wheeling in a Pro Tools rig and taking over half of the control room. And he sort of reluctantly made a little space for us and uh, sent us the tracks off tape and then just said, you guys are on your own from there. <laughs> yeah. And but, I don't think he, he, he doesn't really need to change. No, um, no. He already I, knows how to make a great record. And he fills up his brain with uh, other, other facts and figures that are equally useful. But, but I, it's been important to me ever since the introduction of, the, of digital in 1978, 1979, and then CD and 81, to, to, to speak the truth about what I hear, even though I'm, I'm at many points in these many years, the only voice in the wilderness. And, and I'm, of course, now I'm joined by many. But uh, it just sounded horrible. And it sounded horrible for a long time. And I think we're just beginning to see, just now beginning to see uh, how to fix some of the things. I mean, it's amazing to me that, that we didn't pay more attention to the artifacts. You know, we just kind of ignored the artifacts. But yeah, it's starting to get good, I'm here to tell you. Well, I had the pleasure to do an interview with David Blackmer many years ago, about 20 years ago, at Earthworks. Hey. 
and um, okay. just have a chat with him. And he was really talking about, you know, what was coming in digital audio. I mean, at that point, I still had a Tascam DA30 DAT machine, and that was the extent of my converters, you know, and, and the, my, my audio quality. But he was talking yeah. about, you know, 24-bit, 96K. and So this was David Blackmer Sr., and yes. This was, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. an interesting story that I, I, I think your your listeners might enjoy is I gave my first AES paper ever on parametric EQ at the 1972 Spring Convention when AES used to be two conventions again. Spring Convention in Los Angeles, and I think I had uh, crushed velvet pants, purple pants, and a flowered <laughs> shirt. Nice. But I met David Blackmer was in the same session, and we got to be friends. And he introduced me to some. Um, uh, the concepts in dynamic range control that I I took off from and have built uh, some work on in these last 40 years or whatever, however long that is, uh, that were it's really important. He was a great designer yeah. and a really clever man. He understood. I mean, you see, you understand him as being the, uh, the, the head of DBX and the inventor of DBX, but he understood a trans diode, a PN junction in a transistor, uh, a, a, a diode connected transistor. He understood that that math relationship in a transistor. Wow. Uh, his, his converters drifted. I, I mean, and and his uh, his uh, 160, although it did drift, uh, could be made to sound very good. You have to put better audio chips in it, but could be made to sound very good. Uh, so but no, he he was a friend for years and years. He gave me a he really gave me a lift. So, uh, rock stars, that's how I refer to our listeners, um, the uh, importance of dynamic range controllers uh, for David Blackmer, of course, is that I believe that was at the core of what allowed him to do noise reduction and, um, you know, uh, compression and then expansion to and from tape, right? That's correct. Uh, the system, I'm going to be honest, it didn't work all that well, but it was very clever. And uh, the problem was that it drifted. Um, mm -hmm. both the gain and the scale drifted in his, his, uh, in his uh, log converter and the thing that actually determined the loudness. But what he, what he came up with, and this may be a little bit too geeky, is he came up with a way using very simple silicon to make a very wide range log rhythmic converter or log to DC or the log audio to DC converter. And, uh, and then discovered that if you, if you simply multiply the output of that by twice and put it through a trans diode capacitor, you have the world's most inexpensive and accurate true RMS converter. And mm -hmm. that really was the, the, the heart of this, this, this system, his, uh, uh, his uh, compression expansion system, was having an RMS converter that wasn't bothered by phase shift through the tape recorder, which uh, peak responding detectors were bothered by very much so. So he, yeah, he was very good engineering. Uh, so Rockstars, I just wanted to interject um, and encourage you to know that it's absolutely okay to be fascinated by all this stuff and for it to um, light up the geek in you, but you don't have to understand it. It's okay to both be fascinated and not understand all this stuff yet. Well, and it's also okay, by the way, Rockstars, it's okay to pick up a soldering iron and to get inside a box and see what, see what kind of damage you can do. Be oh. fearless. I've done some damage. I, I've described this before, but I had a wonderful Radio Shack shortwave radio that I used to tune in the Dr. Demento show on. And then I don't know why, but at one point it hit me to just take the entire thing apart. And guess what? I couldn't put it back together again. But it's still, I'm sorry to hear it was that. an educational yeah. experience for me nonetheless. So one of my earliest re-engineering jobs was uh, when I got to start working with Lowell George of Little Feet. Uh, he had a little MXR compressor. I don't know whether you remember MXR pedals, but they made oh, yeah. very cool pedals. They're worth a fortune these days. But he wanted a sound. He wanted more attack. And I got inside this compressor and, and doubled or tripled the size of the charging capacitor so that he would get, I don't know whether you, you know Lowell's guitar sound, but he would get this snap yeah. in his attacks that would, would saturate the amp and the speaker and then kind of back off a little bit. Uh, and that was Lowell George's sound, and, and you know, got it by just going in there and fucking around. That's cool. I, I, you know, when I was in school, I remember spending a Saturday morning taking apart my uh, Proco Rat pedal, and I just sort of reverse engineered the circuit 
you know, not a very complex one, but but complex if you're a kid in school learning this for the very first yeah. time. And yeah. I just sat there, I spent my Saturday doing that, and then I figured out which capacitor was in the audio chain and swapped that out for a big one, and then I called it the fat pedal. I took my Sharpie and crossed out the R. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. So so anyway, that was my introduction to it, and, and I loved it at the time. Now I need reading glasses if I'm going to do any much soldering. I can't solder anymore. I have kids do it. But, you know, I actually stopped soldering a few years ago. I, I went to MATLAB and Simulink, and I'm able to do pretty much all the same things that I used to do with soldering iron and breadboard, except that I don't get um, exposure to, you know, really nasty. You know, tantalum capacitor is blowing up and putting carcinogen. Yeah. carcinogenic uh, gas into the air and rosin core solder. And that's bad too. So, I mean, and I can't see. So very, there you go. There you go. Keep it all well, in the mind. Keep it with ideas. So George, yeah. let us know a little bit more about how you got started in this stuff. How did you kind of get excited and I, discover this stuff I, and start recording? I certainly love music. I always love music and was brought up uh, in a musical family. My mother played piano my brother played and i played played clarinet i played trombone um he uh is now one of my best friends after some years of not estrangement but we just didn't talk a lot but he took a completely different path my brother did he joined the navy and worked his way up to top ranks in the navy where one year under carter he balanced the uh uh deficit by selling a lot of P3s uh, to foreign governments, which are, are the airplane that he flew in the Navy. Huh. And I grew up kind of as the black sheep. You know, I dropped out of college. I went to Johns Hopkins for a little while, dropped out, because I was working in a recording studio and having a great time. But before that, I was hanging out with a guy who moved to town, a guy named Dean Jensen, eventually to become the head or the key guy, Jensen Transformer, and the guy that changed Transformers, he made a much better Transformer. But he and I grew up together, first into ham radio and then into photography. And then his friend Lee Fur, who's now in Tucson, I think he's retired, introduced us to these guys who had a recording studio in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and they had some amazing equipment. They had uh, Ampex 300, 351s, and some amazing microphones. And, and one night he took me over there and played me the Westminster Sonotape demonstration tape, which Mark Rebell actually found a tape. And in fact, this is a good side note. We're at, um, we're at, um, at a tape op and Steve and I are in a panel and he's brought a CD and I brought a two track tape. And the two track tape was an early Westminster Sonotape tape. But I'd heard this, I heard this tape for the first time on buyer headphones of, of an Ampex 300 and it changed my life. I mean, there were immediate shift. There's an immediate shift in my DNA that yeah. said, this, "This is a miracle uh, to be able to have this power over uh, uh, one's emotions through music is, is a miracle." And and this is what I've got to do. So at the, after that point, I wasn't much interested in school. My my uh, I had already had the basics of of uh, parametric EQ and some of the some of the uh, shortcuts in it. And I had a professor at Hopkins, you know, who told me that I was I was wrong, that it was all impossible, that it couldn't be done. Hmm. And I had, and I had, and, and it worked. So I mean, I, I had to get out of there. Those guys were idiots. Well, you, I'm guessing you were already comfortable being a black sheep at this point. I had to be. I, I, I started <laughs> making. I started making my own money when I was 15. Really, uh, work, nice. working in a medical laboratory run by Dr. Curtis Marshall, who was a, a neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins Hospital. His son um, um, was Stephen Marshall, uh, then Stephen St. Croix of the Marshall Time Modulator, and then later Stephen St. Croix Designs. So I knew him as a kid who came to visit his father, and he saw what I was doing and got into audio. So I, 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 I don't know whether that's good or bad. He's he's gone from us now. He was a good guy, uh, George. I, I'm, I thought I'm going to pause for just one sec. It might be that when you lean back, the audio breaks up on because it's kind I'm, of breaking up in and out. So I don't know if they're. I'm not going to lean back anymore. Well, I don't want you to be uncomfortable. I want you to be comfortable. I just uh, maybe we'll okay. figure out. 
where the perfect lean is or something. I'll um, be I'll be comfortable here. All right, cool. I'll, I'll cut that little bit out. Um, also, uh, a great uh, let's shout out to Mark Rubel from uh, Blackbird Academy, who's also been on the podcast, and I owe him a big thanks for connecting um, us as well. You know, he's a he's a visionary. He's a good guy. He's an extremely sensitive guy. He is. Sensitive. He's a connector, and he's he's enabling you know a whole generation um, or more of of students to move move on and keep this stuff going. He's a great teacher. Yeah. Uh, so I also like to sh- ask our guests to share an inspirational quote as we get going. Um, I actually had gotten some, I probably have already had people share your quotes as inspirational quotes on this podcast. Is there anybody that was sort of a mentor for you that, you, that you'd like to, uh, to quote as we get going? Just somebody who gets you excited about recording and making music? I should have thought about that before we started talking. Give me a little while. I'm going to write that down while we talk, and I'll come up with somebody because there have been many. Okay. There have been many. I will. Um, I will leap forward and ask you this question. So I just had Brian Deck on the podcast, and he talked about. Uh, I believe it was his inspirational quote was. He said, from you, talking about designing studios and giving the advice along the lines of. Go figure out where you first got excited by music, what that room was like, what those speakers were like, and design the place for you to make music in your own studio to be just like that. And I wonder if you want to comment on that, you know, agree with well, it, I shoot still, it down, clarify it, I, whatever. I, I still think that's important that, that when you're when you're designing a record, and I'll talk about a record first because I think a studio is is, uh, is 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 important, but having a sound in mind for for how you want to uh, set the music, the, the frame in which you want to set the music is, is a room. And maybe it's, a, maybe it's a, an imaginary room uh, or a, uh, maybe it's a room, uh, the bedroom that you grew up in. I, I remember hearing some rooms in Nashville, just these old rooms in uh, wooden townhouses that just sounded magical. Uh, yeah. And I think uh, it's a good start to talk about how your room sounded when you first realized uh, that music could hypnotize you and enchant you and getting too far away from that. And, and that includes making a room too dead, mm-hmm. um, I think is, is a, a wrong turn. So my, my advice is, is generally to find a space that, that flatters, that flatters music, you know, that gives, that gives you that thrill. And and make your space like that. Now, more often than not, that's hard to do uh, because, of, you know, how, how, how do you design drum rooms? You didn't have drums in your bedroom when you grew up. Or maybe right. you did. <laughs> you know, not for long, maybe. Right. Um, but I, I, I like the idea of diffusion. And, and one of the things that I did that you've probably been introduced to is the room that I did at Blackbird. Yeah. Studio C, which was incredibly expensive, uh, way too expensive. Uh, to make sense, to make business sense. And in, in the business sense, it was a failure and, and an important one. I'll talk more about failures in a second. But the, uh, uh, the sense was to make a room that was an acoustic whiteout, a room that didn't uh, have notable features, modes above a certain frequency and would treat all keys, all music the same. Just about any room is, is uh, controlled by the most reflective closest surfaces. Usually that's the floor and ceiling. And usually that low note is you know, 100 hertz, 110 hertz, or 40 hertz. You know, somewhere in that range is a note that rings that defines the scope of the music that you can make in that room at low frequencies. Because you can avoid it and not have support, or you can hit it and have too much uh, support ringing. And so the room at Blackbird was supposed to be uh, Vanilla. It was supposed to be a blank canvas. That's kind of a, it's kind of wild to hear you describe the design of that space, which is aesthetically so far from something I would ever describe as vanilla as being sonically vanilla. It's great, and it is. And the, the idea is is to make it completely diffuse. It's a completely diffuse room. Well, not completely diffuse, but it's diffuse as we could do for the money. And and you, what's the number? There were 1,725 pieces of four by eight by three quarter inch uh, MDF, medium density fiberboard. That's right. In, in the shop was 95 tons. 
out of the shop was 46, 47 tons. On the wall was 47 tons. So everything had to be designed. The program to, to cut those boards, because every single stick, every single time is an exact length in an exact place. And every board is numbered, so it gets hung on the wall in the right place. And the whole thing was uh, in a massive spreadsheet or something, right? It was in an Excel spreadsheet. I still have it. Massive spreadsheet, um, which won't compute anymore. They don't support Visual Basic anymore. So I have to move it to uh, something else. But the idea was uh, that it was an interesting concept, but it took a lot of work to make it to make it real, and yeah. it was expensive. It's too expensive. Well, too expensive. cutting edge technology and designs and real forefront thinking has always been that way. It's always required that, a, a huge investment of either money or time or, you know, life energy on somebody's and part. Think, thinking of that in particular, it's a room that the town didn't embrace because it was made to put real musicians in a real space, have them listen to each other as much as they could. I mean, they, they had headphones. So we made records in there that were really great and very innovative and, and the, the, and the, the standard at the time were these god awful, and still are these god awful country records with the, you know, where every instrument is a piano is made to sound like a banjo, the banjo is made to sound like a like a steel drum, and it, it music has been so corrupted hmm. by really bad direction, bad bad people, and bad badly motivated uh, people in the music business in uh, Nashville. And luckily, they're pretty much dying off and being replaced by a new generation. Mm, and I'm thinking Jakir King and, and uh, uh, new ears that um, are, are inspired to go in new musical directions. Yeah, Jakir is great. He's making some great records. He's a great guy. And, and he's as much as anybody else in for the performance. He wants to hear a performance. Let's get a band together and see, see what they can do together. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, well, so let's talk a little bit about some of the things you've done here too. Uh, you know, you've already talked about different spaces and you know, dead sounds, live sounds, uh, going through digital. You know, you, you've been making records through the '70s. I've, I've wrote down a bunch of great records that I wanted to ask you about. You made records right through the '80s. Um, more recently, I noticed that you had been overseeing a great deal of of collections or re-releases and classical recordings too. So you've certainly explored all kinds of different recording. Um, but at the beginning of this, you know, you talked about designing the EQ in 1972 or the parametric EQ. Tell us a little bit more about the story of that. What, what was well, it started, a parametric it started EQ? Earlier than that. Oh, well, it started and, earlier than that. What made and, it different from existing EQs? Why was it important? Well, at that time, I had two EQs. I was cutting uh, rock and roll in a two-track studio, doing overdubs, two to two track, and um, I had two EQs. I had an Altic graphic, seven-band graphic, octave graphic, and a Lang PEQ two. That was it. And when I uh, when I ran across something that I couldn't control, I had, was drawn to ask myself why. So I mean, uh, uh, acoustic guitar being very boomy. Well, you could roll off all the low end or put a 57 in front of it to roll off the low end or, or cut the low end. We had a, we had a filter as well, cinema, cinema engineering filter. But that didn't seem to do it either. What I really want to do is to take that, that tone of an acoustic guitar, that frequency, and reduce it to reduce the resonance. I couldn't do it. So that's when I started building uh, equalizers out of T-filters. And it's out of the... Uh, the radio handbook at the time. It's a uh, capacitor in series, capacitor to ground and two resistors, simple T filters, a notch filter. But I got the idea of inverting its response by, by putting it around an early op amp. Well, that was a problem because there weren't any op amps around when I started designing, except right. for instrumentation amplifiers. So, so one of the first things we did was to build a better bipolar transistor op amp with a much wider output voltage swing. And eventually, uh, we improved that. That got better and better. But the but the, the major the major implementation that made I don't want to say made history, but made a difference was the Q control, where you could adjust the shape of the peak or the notch uh, to suit. And um, 
you know, necessity was the mother of invention here. I had to get a, a dip on the snare drum at this frequency and a dip on an acoustic guitar at that frequency and a piano with a boink in it at that frequency. And then, and then please find a pleasing peak by adjusting the cue to be broader than, uh, mm. uh, than, than, than 0.5. At 0.5 to 1, you start having a tonality out of a peak. And you can use this. And uh, a buddy of mine, I think he's a European designer, I think he's Italian, very smart designer, did a thing called Surf EQ, which does is a tracking EQ. And uh, and even at that, you want to be very careful when you add a peak to right. musical because there's a ring in it. Right. It starts to sound like you're singing through a tube. So the parametric equalizer was just to address um, the um, the surgery at the, 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 the surgery that's demanded in the moment, uh, and no more. Is the uh, best way to describe. Um, and I, rock stars, I think it's. I want to point out it's fascinating listening to you, George, talking about you know, why you designed a parametric EQ. And, and Rockstar's a parametric EQ is everything you're familiar with now. All your plugins automatically have bell curve parametric EQs built into them for the most part. There may be some out there are just filters. Very but, few. But we just take it for granted these days. And and it's one of the reasons why I think um, so many people are are – stumped or stymied by this plugin and oh my god what do i do with this this is, seems to do a million possibilities and i think george just gave you some really insightful advice which is you know and george correct me if i'm wrong but i'm going to interpret it um you know start by considering this instrument and where there's a problem in the sound and we've heard this idea of subtractive eq is better or something like that but you just explained it i mean it's like with a sharper q you can find a frequency that is causing problems and you can subtract it. You can cut it at that frequency and remove the boing or the honk or the whatever it is in, in your recording. And then if you're going to go try and boost something to accentuate a frequency, widen that cue out and make a much gentler, softer curve, and you'll get away with giving a little added boost to it. But you know, as soon as you start pushing it a lot, you may run into some troubles, right? Well, but you have to pay attention to it. You just have to, you, you have to pay attention yeah, you you have to listen listen for for an artifact if you if you do boosts, just has to be the right frequency. All right, that's cool. So then, um, the, one of the compressors <laughs> from GML was the eighty two hundred, and if uh, eighty nine hundred, oh, eighty nine hundred. Oh, I said compressor. Yeah. I apologize. I meant the parametric EQ. Yeah, I wanted to stay on EQ for a sec. So the eighty two hundred okay. is is the parametric EQ, and that's the beautiful colorful knobs <laughs> on the black faceplate. The French, the French. French whorehouse, yeah. <laughs> so um, tell us a little bit about that. And, you know, let's say we run into one of the, those in the studio. What do we need to know about it and how do we use it well? Oh, my mind is filled with problems because over the years there have been a lot of, uh, a lot of problems that we haven't been able to address. One of them is that the pots get noisy. Hmm. And it's something that never have been able to really fix except for just leaving analog and going to digital or, or replacing all the pots for it some fabulous uh, figure. The thing, about, the thing about the EQ to me that's consistent across all applications is that you have to use your ears. The first time I brought that EQ to an AES show in fall of 71, before I gave the paper, people farted around with it and their first impression was, well, you know, it's nice, but I need the click stops. I need, I need a, a click stop. You know, this doesn't have any click stops. And you just kind of wanted to shake them and say, don't you understand that this is why this doesn't have click stops? Um, that you, you want to use your ears, not just reach for 5K because that's your favorite frequency on a 550A. Right. But find something that's sweet. Move the frequency around and find something that's sweet. Find something that really is tuned to your frequency of interest. And, the, uh, and that's the same across all of these EQs, is to do it by ear. You know, there, there's a bunch of new EQs out that have spectrum displays uh, behind the uh, uh, the uh, curve shape. Like the FabFetcher <laughs> Pro-Q? That one, that's a plug-in. Yeah, that has and, the, and, and those guys are very nice guys. They gave me, they gave me an authorization, and a lot of my kids uh, use it because it's less expensive than this other one. Um, but, you know, I, we really don't 
think that you get there by trying to identify artifacts by looking at a spectrum display. Mm. You need to use your ears, especially for long uh, modal tones that, that aren't part of a transient. You really need to pay attention to what that sounds like rather than trying to find it out, to, to dig it out on a spectrum display because it's quick and easy and I don't have to use my ears or my brain. That You don't get very far in my class thinking that you can um, – watch a Pro Tools plug-in and do good engineering. Yeah, fascinating. Um, are there some situations where you've found that the visual cues really, are, you're, you're very glad that you've got them? Absolutely. Uh, uh, and we're still looking for a way to integrate a waterfall display so that we can see, you've seen in, in room, taste, so, uh, room tests, a waterfall display where you finally see the modes in a room. Right. Interesting. They really just, they, they stand out. They, yeah, well, you know, and, and you, you, so you, you would like a constant decay. Well, Studio C has constant decay across frequencies. Right. And you don't see a lot of modes until you get to low frequencies. But, and there are two bad ones that nobody's forgiven me for at 66 and 91 or something like that. <laughs> but, uh, but otherwise, it's just as smooth as new fallen snow on a slope. Um, but in most rooms, they're boinky. You know, you have two or three kinds of modes, axial and oblique modes and, and weird modes that build up. And you can't, you can't apply science to that stuff. You know, it's just, it's just too, it's, it's way too unpredictable. Um, but what you can do, what you can do is, is learn, to, learn to avoid them or at least understand what they do to your music. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sorry. So the studio that you designed at Blackbird is Studio K. Is that the letter? Studio C. Studio C. Sorry, I, I miss. I just misheard. Um, so I wanted to say that when I interviewed Mark Rubel, we did our interview from Studio C intentionally. Now, what's funny about that is that when I first started building these surfaces at Skywalker, no, I first started building them at the complex, which, which was my studio in West LA, mm -hmm. 1980, 1981. Uh, I used quadratic residual, uh, quadratic residue diffusers, mm -hmm. which are a little bit kind of math in the walls and ceiling. And I put them up and I noticed that immediately the room was flatter. I didn't need room EQ or monitor EQ because the diffusion in the room had flattened the room out. That same surface I designed for uh, uh, Skywalker Sound, these big eight-foot roll-around, four-by-eight-foot roll-around surfaces that to this day they put around instruments to help diffuse the sound out into this big room and capture better the sound of this big room. I was talking to Leslie Ann Jones of this thing two weekends ago. They still use them every day, and that was 30 years ago. Wow. And George George Lucas, for years, always had his picture taken in front of him. So there's, there's a kind of a magnetic effect to diffusion. Now, the ones in Studio C are called primitive root diffusers. It's a far bigger number. It's, uh, it's a prime root of 138,000. I've got it written down. 138,767. Yes. From that, we, we have. And, and Peter D'Antonio actually helped me come up with that, which was a proper... Uh, prime to build that room based on. We're getting off the subject here. Well, that's all right. Let's let's Sorry do this. That. We can shift um, away from diffusion with uh, a, a succinct explanation of what exactly diffusion is for somebody who you know hears the word but doesn't know what that is. I, I would um, prompt it by saying we're probably familiar with the sound of a flat wall is if we send sound to it and it bounces back at us. And diffusion is quite different than that. Well, let's look at diffusion this way. Walk up to a window and breathe on it and it turns frosty. Mm -hmm. that, that's diffusing light. And sharp lines of light aren't as discernible. So in a diffuse room, Sharp sources of sound as they come back uh, from the walls aren't discernible. The direct sound is, mm -hmm. but the reflected or the, the ambient sound is not. The ambient sound has less peaks and dips. It's an acoustic whiteout. And when ambient sound has peaks and dips and begins to crowd the direct sound, uh, the listener's ear 
and brain get a little more confused about identifying what's going on, right? The the listener's brain gets confused as to where it's coming from, so there's a localization issue. Uh, But there's also a timbral issue where you're 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 uneasy about the balance. It's uh, notes pop out and harmonics pop out; others are suppressed. Um, And so diffusion more diffusion in a room. God, I, I don't think I've ever had this need to explain it, but uh, diffusion in a room, I'd have to think about that. Now I'm confusing myself. I think of Uh, the sound as as rather than reflecting back as a hard reflection, it's coming back in many directions. That is exactly right. Staggered times and everything, right? Well done. Exactly right. Yeah. And in a room with 138,000 different little surfaces reflecting, little three-quarter by three-quarter inch surface. That's a lot of diffusion. That's a lot of different sounds coming back. Yeah, it's almost like the reflections are the the minions in that movie. What's the uh, the uh, Despicable Me movie? Those little yellow minions all trying to yeah. collaborate and come and you know hit you with one reflection, but they can't do that when they're all over the place and disorganized. So uh, John <laughs> John was sitting in a in Studio C with a, a, a brilliant but but blind piano player, and I've forgotten his name. Good guy, good player, blind, who finds his way around with echolocation. Oh, interesting. Wow. And he hears something come back, and John says, I thought his name was Gordon. I, I have to ask. We have to figure that out because the guy needs credit. He says, okay, find the walls. And he goes, I don't know. There's a music stand, you know, because it's ringing. There's a music stand, and, and over here is a, a mic stand, and... Oh, oh, man. It it. Oh, man. Ran into the wall. Said a guy could really get hurt in here. Wow. <laughs> that's pre- that that uh, pretty much sums it up. That's that's fascinating. What happens when you have a flat reflective wall? You have a sound hitting it. You get back a thing called a comb filter. It's exactly the same comb filter as in, as in uh, uh, what happens with a harmonizer or time delay. Mm-hmm. Uh, with fa- what we used to call phasing or flanging. Yeah. That's that's a moving comb filter. You get that off of every surface in the room. That's why rooms sound hollow. That's why rooms sound hollow and weird. You know, you put up a microphone in your in your untreated bedroom and it's a, the weirdest sound you ever heard because yeah. of all of these uh, comb filtered returns off the walls. That's uh, so fascinating, yeah. Among other yeah. Um, well, let's let's also jump over and talk about the GML eighty nine hundred dynamic range controller. Um, I, had, that I had written let, down let, that it has something to do with loudness, like our ears do, and I wondered if you could explain how that works. Let's, let's talk about this. Let's just talk about how uh, over the years we've become more and more drawn to think of compression as crushing the yeah. sound. Yeah. You know, you, uh, compressions work. Compressors working when you crank it. Oh man, that's really compressing good. That'll work. Uh, loud. Well, it's louder, it's better. Compressors only make things softer. It can't make something louder. Better arrangements or, or better, uh, better organization of a presentation can make sound louder, but compression doesn't make sound louder. Uh, compressors help Chris Lord Alge force more sausage in the skin. You know, you just. <laughs> Pump, pump it in, pump it up. Um, but it doesn't make things louder. And the perception of compression, our modern view as teachers is to separate compression from dynamic range control. Dynamic range control is when you have a singer that sings some notes low and some notes loud. It won't fit down a modern pipe. It's The quiet stuff gets buried. Mm-hmm. And the loud stuff is too loud and covers up other things. So that's because a guitar player never turns his amp down; only turns it up. And in fact, the higher the better, right? Isn't that yeah, it? yeah. So, so that thing that we we we're hoping that we'll do more of, because there's some great records in history, modern and in history, that just don't have crush dynamics, and there's some terrible records that are identified. I'm thinking of Death Magnetic, a nader for all of us, the worst worst recording ever. 
brewer's mix ever. It's fascinating. There's a, there's a recent story about that. Were you at the AES presentation um, from Ian Shepard and, and Bob Ludwig? I have followed that presentation because Bob and I do that same presentation. Well, I um, Ian Shepard is a f- good friend and audio blogger and teacher from the UK, and he wrote the viral article that stirred up the the uh, awareness of death magnetic being I, too late. I think I heard that from Bob. Right. right. And yeah. and I was there, and I, I was able to snap the candid photograph of Ian introducing himself to Andrew Sheps on the floor of AES. And, well, and Andrew and, was great, but they, it was just a really and, funny Andrew's moment. Andrew's great. And Andrew, I'd, I'd love to get a little bit more of Andrew's time to talk about how he hears as, a, as an engineering producer, because he, to my mind, is is of the finest. I love the work that he does. I yeah. love what he gets out of a band. I love what he gets out of a mix. And I love more than anything else that he is artist-centric. He is there for the artist. He doesn't make the same record every time. He makes the artist's record yeah. and makes it well and really listens to an artist. But we did get, Bob and I did get into a little bit of a, um, uh, I don't want to call it a misunderstanding, but we would we would have to point to Ted Jensen and saying, that's the mix that he got in, was Andrew Sheff's mix. Mm-hmm. That's the mix he got in. He couldn't remaster it. Right, right. There wasn't anything he could do to remaster it. And he went, and Ted Jensen, as you know, went public with that, and sort of now Metallica isn't speaking to him anymore. Um, but that that was a crushed mix. Yeah, it was. And and um, there was a great quote from Andrew. I saw uh, somebody shared a YouTube clip of him saying that um, uh, he talked about handling that and trying to convert that for different file formats, MP3 and iTunes and YouTube and these different places. And in the end, they just had to turn it down. 0.7 dB was the best solution for allowing these other um, methods to process the audio. But he had a funny quote. He just said like, well, you know, I, I, I won the loudness war, so we're done. Now we can go back, <laughs> which is a great quote. That, it, that's a great quote. The yeah. last time he talked to Bob Ludwig and I, he denied that he had crushed the mix. And we, we don't agree. We know he did. But that's okay. We, we're all to be forgiven. Sure. I mean, That's we what, had we had to figure out where the, you know, life and, and creativity is about going to the edge of the cliff. And, and a little further. It is. Just a little further, a little further and further. finding out if it's too far. And yeah. Then, and then come back. And that was that was it. So hopefully, uh, hopefully we're like, like Andrew said, we're good. So the 8900 is a dynamic range controller. And we now have, a, you have a Pro Tools system, right? I have a Pro Tools HDX, yeah. So... I'll send you, you'll give me your iLock name and I'll send you our newest uh, DRC2, which is oh, the 8900 cool. writ large. The 8900 had sort of two time constants that were internally uh, locked together, variable, but locked as to their ratio. The new one has uh, a separate peak override that's more a short asset uh, uh, calculator. And what I've what I've done that's patented now, and what I've done is to combine these in a way that is close to the way ear, the ear hears, and that's not RMS; it's an exponent of three. It's a higher exponent, wow, and a cube root, and uh, some better soft knees, and uh, a better what I used to call hysteresis, which is now just you know, automatic release. Right. So I'll send it to you uh, and see what you think. Hysteresis, uh, when I used to see those knobs in a studio, I thought it just meant it was referring to the hysteria I would feel at trying to understand how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of shit for that and the uh, and the crest factor. Oh, um, the two completely reasonable engineering terms that, that uh, people did not want to uh, embrace. That's fascinating. But hysteresis is that it has a different characteristics, different characteristic going in than coming out of compression. Yeah, right, right. It's almost like it has one threshold on the way in, but it has another threshold to let go on the way back. Another way of handling the dynamics. So uh, I've done a bunch of the, the way I did design was I designed something and do a bunch of records with it where I used it on everything mm-hmm. and, and just to see what worked and what didn't. I, I'm, not, I'm not doing that as much anymore. I, I haven't tried building the compressor that does it all. Now, this is the best vocal compressor ever the best vocal dynamic range controller compressor ever. And I can't imagine anybody that's coming close. There are some really good new even tide designs mm-hmm. uh, for, for transit versus steady state 
balance. This does a different thing. But uh, the records that I'm proudest of these days, you didn't mention. I'm proudest of uh, the Toto records. Oh, cool, I mi- cool. I mixed uh, the Miles Davis cut on Toto 6. I hung around with those guys for years. And would I'd use them on other sessions, Jeff. And uh, in particular, Jeff Picaro was kind of our go-to drummer. When, uh, but the, when uh, did you start working with Toto? Well, I started working with the musicians well before... Well, before four, when they were still backing up Boz Gags, uh, Silk Degrees, we got to be friends when we were in the same studio for Silk Degrees. And this is in the 1970s? This is in 74, 75, 76, somewhere in there. Okay. And it was in, in Hollywood, Holly Weird. Um, were... But the, but the, one of the records I'm proudest of, and I've got, and I'm just starting to get students listening to it, is Total Seven. Toto 7 was produced by Billy Payne and I. And uh, it finally made money, but not in the U.S. because Donnie Einer hated Toto and wouldn't promote it in the U.S. It's a good well, record. All right, cool. I will include a link to that um, in the show notes for sure so that the rock stars can go check it out and get to know it better, and myself included. I do know that as I was listening through records that you made in the 70s, I just love the sound of that, you know, and... I wanted you to talk about how the sound of making records in the seventies shifted into the eighties. You know, what did that mean? Um, what were the ways that you made records? But like one of the first records I clicked on was a Ramsey Lewis Salongo record that you did. Oh yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah. Loved it. You know, Sun and then, Goddess. Sun Goddess and and um what was the other one? There were two hits off that record. I don't yeah, I don't have all the song titles in front of me, but uh, just great, great sounds. And, um, you know, what what was it about the sound of a record like that then? What do you think other than... Well, I was, uh, working, I, I was working with a guy who had was just, who thought he was a producer. He wasn't. Um, but he let me do anything I wanted. And I was coming out of classical music. I'd moved from, I lived in Paris in 73, 74, married my first wife in Paris. She was American, but I married her in Paris. And we moved from Paris to Los Angeles. But I really, I love classical music and bluegrass. And I've always loved R&B. And and so here was an opportunity with Earth, Wind & Fire to do these beautiful voices over this hard edge rhythm section. And and the writing kind of supported that sound. So Mm -hmm. that the sound of the vocals in Earth, Wind & Fire, I can say without being... With generating an argument, I did that sound. That was me and Philip and Maurice in the studio for weeks and weeks and hours and hours and days and days. And we didn't have tuning, so I mean, I had to, I, I, I was the tuning call. Yeah, and uh, I'm guessing that you're referring to layering the voices and things like that when you're when you're talking about yeah. the tuning in those hours. What about at the beginning stage of a record like that? I wanted to ask, you know, how did you capture a groove when you were recording a band like that, was well, it a single well, take? Was it edits? Was it punching? The same, the same way, the same way you would recognize a groove today, which is how does it feel? Mm-hmm. You know, don't look for mistakes. Don't, don't look for things that you can enhance. Don't look for things that you, but didn't I didn't hear any mistakes in, in earth, wind and fire. Oh man, I should play you some of the stuff. I played September at an AES show last, last fall, not this fall, but fall before. And man, um, you, it, it, it's full of mistakes, but you just don't pay any attention to them because the sound is so good. Yeah. Same thing on Stevie Wonder's record. If you've ever heard the Superstition multi-track, there are all kinds of clams and the turn around sounds like Stevie's playing with boxing gloves. Oh, that's great. But you know you don't hear it. It's just feel. It's just pure feel. So, so I, I think these days we're trying to get back to how it feels. Is the tempo right? Is the key right? Is it, it, does it, it does tempo leave room for phrasing? Is the vocal comfortable in this in this pocket? Do you have yeah. enough of a pocket for a vocal? I think I think we're doing things. We've been doing things all along. You know, there's no old way to make a record, no new way to make a record. They're just uh, emerging questions. What uh, if? Um, it's great to hear you talk about starting out with the tempo of a song so that it it, it 
pays respect to these other elements that need to fit in there, yeah. right? And the vocal being relaxed. The horns in Earth, Wind, and Fire, they remind me of a Burt Bacharach part or something. You know, they're so relaxed the way those uh, trumpets and... Um, well, you know. when they are relaxed, they're not always relaxed. I stay in touch with Jerry Hay, which was who was one of the main trumpet players and an arranger on a bunch of this stuff. Jerry Hay is a great guy. He He would... He would play third trumpet because he couldn't hold up in the first position for the parts that he wrote. So that was Gary Grant or uh, Chuck, what's his name? But um, some of those parts were, were beautiful. Some were really edgy, like Shine and Star. That was a bitch to play. And uh, uh, the fasting. They became march, marching band favorites. Right. Every college marching band in the world plays a uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire tune, usually in the stone. Now, what was the connection between Tower of Power and Earth, Wind, and Fire? None. Um, I, I knew the guys in Tower of Power. Uh, Doc was, was an old friend, and we went way back. And the connection, if anything, was that um, I was a trombone player. Mm -hmm. And so I knew the ranges of instruments and how horns should sound and really went out of my way overdubbing to make sure that we went over it until it was right. We weren't, I wasn't accepting mistakes. Yeah. Guys, the guys hated that. <laughs> they hated that. I have um, been in the position of producing engineering horn players, and I was far from qualified as a horn arranger. I didn't know anything I was doing. We were just making it up as we went. And it was yeah. pushing the hell out of a horn player that I learned about things like, embouchure and it only lasts for so long like you only get a, a little window there and you can beat up a professional and they're not going to be able to give you anything more after a minute you know well more than a minute yeah, and, well e even these professionals that we hired i mean these were the first call guys and everybody wanted to play on an earth wind and fire record because that was the horn sound yeah but i did everything different i used you know little di no, small diaphragm microphones i, I went for the the brilliant, bright sound of the horns. You know, I wanted them to sound fiery. Um, re recorded them at a distance so we weren't breaking up the microphone. Uh, I, I modified Cam 84 so they didn't have as much gain and you couldn't break them up as yeah. easily. Um, but mostly, I, I really loved horn, horn parts and horn players. Would you have used rim mics as well for horn recording like that? We didn't have enough channels. Here's the thing is, I, so I'm reviewing September and the string tracks, I'm recording a 40-piece orchestra with woodwinds and French horns, and they're on three tracks. Wow. So I didn't have any room for room mics. I had leakage. You know, I didn't try to suppress the leakage. We used to go to Warner Burbank 1 for the big string uh, dates. You know, it spent a lot of money, but it sounded huge. Yeah, and, but you would use more than three mics. You would mic up. A oh no, we'd use a bunch of mics. Yeah, we'd use. Uh, well, you could, there are various techniques over the years. Um, uh, often, an overall mic, and I've forgotten what I used overall. It might have been Shep's MK twos, but I haven't changed that much. And in, in these days, when we do classical, we do a decatry in the center or modified decatry with the center in front. I use uh, CO one hundred K Sankins. Uh, but we have MK2 Shep's Outriggers, and that's basically my the same strength sound that I've been doing for 50 years. Now, and can, all the can you yeah. kind of describe for um, those of us who don't know, we've heard decatry, but we don't really know what it is. Can you sort of explain what it is? The decatry is three microphones, generally thought of as M50s, at a reasonable distance, a variable distance, but a reasonable distance, uh, maybe a meter and a half. Three microphones, so two left and right, and one out into the center. But it's, a, it's and, forward. It's in front of the other two mics, right? The one in the center is in front of the other two mics. And the degree to which you want to enforce the center, you'll bring that mic further into the orchestra or back. But that, it's all in setting the height of the mics, the width of them. And I'm, I'm not the classical expert on our faculty. Richard King and Martha DeFrancisco are the, are the classical experts. But we still do work much the same way. You know, I, 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 can, I can record an orchestra as easily as a rock band. So I'm thinking, I'm trying to think through the logic in that three mic setup. And I'm going to say that when that center mic um, is forward more, 
then there's more of a time delay before it hits the left mic or the right mic, and our brain is just going to register that we're hearing the sound come from the center rather than hearing it more from the left or right. Well, it also makes the left and right a little bit wider. It makes them a little bit wider. It, it softens the center. It doesn't enforce the center. It softens the center and makes it wider. And are we I hearing? Think, are we probably think. hearing some comb filtering between those two mics as well? I don't think so because it's a very complex acoustic space. Yeah, it's a very complex uh, relationship between a player three or four meters away and these microphones. Right. I mean, if if it were in an anechoic room and there were a hard wall, you you would hear comb filtering, but not in this in this diffuse. Fascinating. Um, well, since we're talking about. Uh, that Let, let's actually take a break and we'll come back in for the jam session. Um, Rockstars, I, I'm going to include links to the stuff we're talking about with George in the show notes. If you're on your mobile device, you can click right through and, uh, and just click on the link with your finger. You'll find it there. If you're online or on your computer, just go to rsrockstars.com and uh, search for George Massenberg and it'll take you right to the blog post. We'll see you guys in just a second for the jam session. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Super Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299. Or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Are you having trouble getting your mixes to sound professional? Are you mixing and mastering yourself? Did you know that the vast majority of the world's best mix engineers almost never master their own mixes? So if you're thinking about hiring a professional mastering engineer, check out Chris Graham Mastering. Chris is a billboard chart-breaking mastering engineer who has mastered thousands of songs for both professional and home studio clients just like you. Send one of your songs to Chris and he'll master a sample of your song for free. If you decide to hire him, you can also get a free video mix consultation before mastering to help you get the most out of your mix. To learn more, check out chrisgrammastering.com or just click the link in the show notes. Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is George Massenberg joining us from Montreal. And uh, we're going to jump in with additional questions about ma the many great records he's made and uh, also talk about some new sample libraries that may be coming your way. George, are you ready to jam? I am. All right, dude. Um, you were wanting to tell me about these sample packs that you're working on with uh, um, Superior Drummer from Toontrax. Tell us, tell us more about that. I've, uh, I was introduced to Superior Drummer by Chuck Ainley, who did Superior Drummer 2 live recording and samples. And boy, they, they, they expanded what I knew of as a, as a, a drum sampler. I, I grew up in the studio with the original LM1. Roger Lynn brought over the original LM1 to play it to David Foster in 1980, or 81, wow. whatever that was. We were working on the average white band. And uh, boy, it was amazing, but it sounded shitty. Uh, Prince loved the sound, and of course, he made a career of, of that sound, as did the many um, hip hop artists who made a career out of the that drums, that kick drum sound, that awful kick drum sound. Um, well, it's fascinating because I just did an interview also with Eric Bazilian, and you, know, you guys shared a um, and a story of having a drum machine, but you really wanted it to sound like real drums. And so you were trying to figure out how to make it do that, you know, whereas of course, you know, Prince is using the Lynn drum and doesn't have to sound anything like real drums. It just sounds like doesn't his production. Like, and and Eric like was, you know, he had a, a, an original 808, which most people would, you know, they might, um, um, you know, trade a relative for or something, but 
but he just was frustrated because it didn't really sound like a real drum set. No, the 808, my problem with the 808 is it's not heavy enough to be a boat anchor, but that's about all it's good for. <laughs> I hate the 808. That's funny. 909. Let's and not, let's not hate funny. on the 808. No, 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 I don't love it. But, uh, but that, that doesn't matter. But what, we're, what we'd like to do now is, is to have live drums. We love live drums. We love the expression that, that, that finds a voice in how to sing and in how to play a song from drums playing the song, not just playing a backbeat, but playing the song. We love the lyrical drummers, the Russ Kunkels and the Vinnie Calutas, uh, the, the, the uh, Steve Gads, the lyrical drummers. Uh, for us, it was uh, Carlos Vega, um, mm. Jim Keltner, you know, just great, great lyrical drummers that play the song. So machines don't play the song. But if you've got an idea of a groove as a writer, what a great entry into orbit of a session to give the drummer something to play to. And actually, the guy I learned the most from was Phil Collins, working with Phil Collins, who would come in with a groove, you know, the kind of an amazing, ridiculous groove. And he would leave room around one and three so that he would get a sense of the groove, but he wouldn't have something that would flam on one and three. And, um, and it was a really cool idea. Um, so I stole that. And, and of course, so often Phil would, would use that sound anyway in his records, would add the sound and it wasn't just a guide track. But to the extent that we could add something to um, pre-production where we decide on the tempo, you know, with the singer, decide on the groove, decide on the pocket, and, and get, a, get a, a groove for the drums that's relative to the phrasing a groove that supports the, 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 the phrasing, whatever that is. And that gives the drummer a leg up when he or she goes in to start a track. So anyway, so I've been using uh, Spirit Drummer 2 for a couple of years, and they invited me to do the recording for Spirit Drummer 3. And I asked if we could take it to the limit, and they foolishly said yes. <laughs> and we did it We did it in 11-1. We did it in 5-1 uh, in, uh, plus height four microphones for height and two microphones for God outrigger and uh, every drum and two technologies for overhead, a Byram 201 and a Sankin CU 44 X, which I had modified as drum overheads. So you could either have condenser or dynamic overheads and they're completely different sounds. Interesting. Uh, Stereo underneath snare mic. So when you get really in on the snare, you want the under bottom snare mic. You have it in stereo, so it doesn't have that sort of laser-like sound to it. Hmm. Uh, three kick mics. Uh, my friend uh, and two-track innovator Matthias Eklund brought his uh, uh, Erland microphones, these Swedish microphones with the uh, is it a triangular capsule. It's a weird shaped capsule. Wow. You can only get Sweden, but they sounded great. Uh, so we had Erlens, CO100Ks and the 5.1. And so for any given drum bath, we had all the bleed to all the other drums recorded. So any, any single drum also went down to 23 or more uh, tracks of other drums times however many dynamic levels. So, I mean, the whole package is... 100,000 samples um, with giving you complete control over bleed and how much room, different kinds of room, different kinds of space. And it's, it's fantastic program um, wow. beyond, beyond just the sounds. So uh, I'm, I'm really proud of that. And those guys are great to work with. Um, well, this is very cool. And I know superior drummer is one, that you can program with MIDI. So you can, you know, if you have a, the MIDI file of a great drum performance, you can sort of dial in the drum sounds or you could program something. Although it may sound less like a real drummer if you start programming it too, unless you, you play it in. It's, a, it's surprising. If, if you play it into pads with a, you know, a MIDI over IP, high speed MIDI, man, it's, it's hard to tell the difference. I mean, really? you've got a real drummer playing and the sounds are in a real room and it's, it's pretty good. 
That's cool. I love what that does for anybody with a home studio anywhere. Yeah. You know, it really makes it possible to record something that sounds like it was done in a real studio because you've got real drums now, you know. And it's a real studio. This was done at Galaxy Studios in Mole, Belgium, the quietest studio I've ever been in. It's a 10 dB SPL in the room. Wow. No, no helicopters flying over, no airplanes flying over. It's the quietest studio anywhere. And, uh, and big. That's pretty cool. What were some of the things that you learned from doing this? I mean, you know, what did you say? 10,000 samples per? Well, mostly, I mean, I, I, I don't think I learned a lot about recording, but boy, I learned a lot about data management. Yeah, I was uh, going to ask. That's one of the questions well, I like to ask on the podcast and the jam session is, uh, what advice do you have for people to keep their shit together? How did you do that? Well, um, by writing shit down, you know, and keeping keeping everything labeled and keeping uh, lists of what sounds are on what drives. And, and it's more important. So let's switch to that for a second, because that's really important for delivery. The, the other thing <coughs> that I'd like to bring up is I worked starting in 2002 with Naris in Nashville, building the master delivery document, what you need to deliver to get paid by a record company at the end of a record. Uh, master delivery recommendations sort of tell you what you got to do and what formats delivered on and how tracks should be organized and labeled. And you just got to, you got to follow, you got to follow a system. You got to organize your work, organize your backups, follow a system. That's on, that's on the uh, recording Academy site on oh, the grand cool. Farm site. Cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Let me, let me ask you this. When, when you're talking about doing these sample libraries, I envision there was, you know, uh, I, I guess it was 150 years ago, something like that, or, or longer, when, you know, Harvard would have a room full of um, women who I guess weren't at that time allowed to be considered the, uh, the um, scientists studying the stars, but they would catalog all the, the, the candle ratings for stars from photos of the the uh, the galaxy. I imagine that that keeping track of all these different velocity hits for every sample and every sound felt a bit like that, like cataloging the stars. You know. Well, actually, we depended a lot on on the player. The performer was Norm Garsh from uh, Zurich, who's a great jazz drummer, and he was actually able to keep it together to do a complete series. And to do a series, you hit a drum about a hundred times with space in between symbol. You'd sometimes have to wait 10 seconds for the symbol to fade, right. but he's able to, to keep a consistent hit, even while he's decreasing in loudness for a hundred hits. And he's really brilliant. So, I mean, much of the, of the keeping track of loudness was done by Norm. Fascinating. Um, but we had a series. But the, the, this is worth mentioning. Um, Matthias Eklund had a system of labeling a, a snare drum where he would have some 40 different samples in different folders all labeled exactly the same thing. <laughs> exactly the same label. And so you had to know the folder and the drum and the date and the sequence and the set and have this folder structure together um, but you can see why he did it is to easily change between sets. But my God, that was hard to really hard to grasp, hard to wrap one's mind around. But we came up with a system to document, and and of course it works. I mean, he's brilliant. That's fascinating. Uh, is brilliant. Well, I'm awfully glad there's somebody as smart as you doing that for us, so that we can just. <laughs> I'm glad you know, he did it for me. We yeah. can just hit it with our MIDI triggers and make some records. Yeah, man. Um, well, let's see. Let me let me look at some other records that really stood out to me. I mean, you'd worked with Stanley Clark. Um, there was you, you've done stuff. There was one great record here, uh, Philip Glass songs for, from Liquid Days um, with Chronos Quartet. Uh, just over. Yeah, I just okay. did, I just did Linda overdubs on that, but it was great meeting those guys and and seeing the musicianship of of new music. So um, I know that another artist that you worked with, uh, George, was Linda Ronstadt. And there was one of the records that really stood out as a, a big, beautiful sound uh, is, is Humming to Myself. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about making that record. That was Linda's 
a small combo jazz record. We'd already done the big orchestra records, uh, What's New, and the two records that followed that, and uh, Around Midnight, and the other one, I forget, the middle one. But we had done the big orchestra record, the American Songbook. And she wanted to do the combo record. She wanted to do Cry Me a River and um, Miss Otis Regrets. And they're just beautiful personal performances. And um, and uh, it was it was a different kind of record. Great rhythm section. That, that was uh, uh, Christian McBride on bass. And mm. uh, great section. And, you know, it's funny you talk about the we had already done the big records, but really that one sounded huge to me. Is there something, you know, that you experience when you record minimally that allows everything to just be a lot bigger and a lot be a little bolder. closer. Yeah, closer. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk never, a little bit about that? Well, I've never. I've got to go back and listen to it because I haven't listened to it uh, since we remastered it a couple years ago. I've got to go back and listen to it. What about uh, just? Can, can you comment on what that means that that uh you know, less is more in recording and why it is possible that something with fewer things can be bigger and, and think, more in your face? I think, I think Prince is a great example of the simpler record just being more clearly framed, uh, sharper lines, uh, more clearly defined timbres, and less diffuse, if you want to put it that way. The, the, the ideas were, are less diffuse. The writing is crisp, or the arrangements are crisper, the recording is crisper. But I'll have to go back and listen to it because I, I haven't. I've done a lot of records. Right. So well, I don't get back to listen to them very much. How about commenting on the shift from you know the way you guys made records and the sound of records in the '70s to the sound of records in the '80s? How would you explain think, to somebody what happened? That's a fantastic question because I've never heard it any other way than what I'm doing now. I mean, I was trying to do it that way then. I was trying to have stereo overhead drum mics, but I didn't have enough channels. I mean, we didn't have enough tracks. Um, channels, more importantly, the tracks. Generally, we were 24 input consoles, and boy, you ran out of inputs pretty quickly. But yeah. I always heard the sound that I'm getting now. I've always heard the snare drum sound that I get today is the one that I've been chasing for 50 years. Um, I think what's different is not working on analog tape. Uh, I hated tape. I didn't like tape. Everything only sounded muffled. It only sounded like this. Yeah. And and with Earth and Fire, Maurice and Phillips voices, those high tenors, they they'd hit some high interval and all I'd hear is distortion. All I'd hear is distortion off the tape. Like intermodulation so, kind of stuff. I am the tape. exactly. Exactly. And it and it's another tone. It's another tone yeah. that that you know tape was telling me that I needed. So the tape would provide me with this other, this other tone, this other. It's like another vocal part. Harmonic. Yeah. It's like another vocal part, but it's out of tune and I can't control it. So when we had the first digital, the first thing I noticed is that it had its own problems. But the other thing that we noticed is it didn't have a lot of that artifact. And I, I was happy without it. I've never, Never. I, I went back and did a Journey record on uh, on tape mm -hmm. with Kevin, Kevin Shirley. Um, you know, and he's a master of tape. He's a good guy, good ear, good good producer. But I, I hated tape. I just hated it. Um, what are some of the things? Why do you think people have this nostalgia for tape, or, or this does, you know this love for tape and love for analog <laughs> and stuff? Do you think it is I, the style? I no, I think people have nostalgia for a shortcut. You know, they're thinking that we have a shortcut. But we didn't. I mean, the, the, the truth is, is that we, we tried things. We experimented a lot. We failed 99 out of 100 times, you know, to, to make a new sound. And, and, we, and our experiments, you know, were, were, were woven into other techniques that eventually worked or or didn't, but, uh, but we just tried things. The other thing is we responded more to the feeling of what we were hearing. We we're trying to do, Lowell George was trying to save the world. Lowell George thought that he could write and perform a song to save the world. And uh, was terribly disappointed when it was harder than, than he thought. But, the, uh, but, but it was more, it has always been more about a feeling. How does it make me feel? Because Plugins don't do feelings. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have a 
button on a plugin says, make it feel better. It feels shitty. Make it less shitty. Make it feel less shitty. This feels contrived. Mm -hmm. uh, this feels like an insincere performance. Plugins don't do that. And we tend to want to fix everything with, uh, with uh, effects or plugins or processing, and, and it's just wrong. That's wrong. Now, it's not bad to use them, and, and we all will occasionally have to tune a vocal. We'll all put cool reverbs, and I love building slaps. The reason you want to listen to the seventh one because is because tunes like Anna have the most complex reverb soundstage that I've ever crafted. It's like seven different reverbs. That's in Toto 7? That's in Toto 7, Anna. When did you and make that very, record? When was that? 1987, is what I want to say. 1988. Okay. I don't know. It took a year. I think it was the year my son was born. So 1988. Okay, cool, cool. But, but uh, this really complex reverb space. And you'd appreciate it, buddy. How uh, were you using um, digital reverbs at that time, or was it all acoustical I reverb? Was, I was. I'm glad you mentioned that, because I, I did have acoustical spaces. We had a big sound stage, an acoustical space. We had plates. We had a good EMT stereo plate. I had an Eventide 2016, which is designed by my buddy Tony Yellow, who is still designing great effects. There's a new uh, effect series from Eventide that I can't wait to get my hands on. Uh, we had uh, EMT 250s uh, for a short chamber. Mm -hmm. We had uh, Roland 880, which was a kind of a 3D uh, positioner. Mm -hmm. We had something else in there. I can't remember it. But we had a lot of different, a lot of different effects. Oh, and of course, AMS. Uh, RMX. Mm -hmm. So uh, we would spend days making very complex spaces, beautiful spaces, dreamy spaces. So uh, listen to that record if you get a chance. Yeah, definitely. So let me ask you this question. Um, when you are empowered with so many cool reverb and space making effects, um, and then also the, do you also had just the acoustic space itself had a great reverb as well? Yep. Um, what advice do you have for how to um, carefully and artistically put them all together? Is it okay to mix well, a bunch of them? Well, well, that's exactly what you do, and put different things on different instruments. You build, you build something that matches this picture that you have in your mind's ear. You have this picture. I can just picture a space, and it's it's uh, maybe exotic, or maybe it's. Uh, there's another record I'm really proud of uh, Jennifer Warren's famous blue raincoat. The actual cut famous blue raincoat has seven different reverbs and loops on it. And it goes from scene to scene in a subtle and natural way, you know, from a, a rain soaked street into a jazz club, into a large, beautiful, lush performance space, right back to a, a rainy street. And, um, and I'm really proud of that record. I, I mixed the two, cuts on it that it's best known for, which is Bird on a Wire and Famous Blue Raincoat. Okay, cool. Um, but that's still in the catalog. Do you know uh, Michael Carnes over at Exponential Audio? He was I designing do. for Lexicon for years. I, yeah, I do. And I've used some of his plugs, although I can't tell you which one right offhand. I've been using yeah. the Nimbus reverb I, I, I really yeah, that's, like. That's pretty good. The other the other good one is... Uh, is uh, Excalibur is sort of a more um, post-production uh, surround. No, I mean... Different brand? I've seen that, but I'm thinking of another thing, and I can't remember the name of it. It's a big, expensive one. It's one that we use in classical music a lot. Um, let's talk Everything. about classical for a sec. So I noticed that you had uh, a number of cre credits, or at least, uh, you know, assuming any of my, my research is accurate, the, the credits um, for particular classical records... Um, what what have you been involved in with classical, and have you been sort of remastering well, older recordings? The most recent one that we did was Nico Keto doing a uh, mm -hmm. a percussion record. It's Stephen Reich uh, electric counterpoint, where she rearranged for marimba, vibes, and steel drums, and we did that live at Blackbird. 
and oh, did, it cool. in, did it did it 192 k surround and it, it was a hit it was a hit on lynn records it sold 2200 records it was big. <laughs> uh, but that was beautiful, beautiful sounding record though and the last um You've heard of that? Could well, I mean, I, you know, it's the thing about doing research these days is so much of this is on YouTube. So I'm not hearing high fidelity necessarily, but I can easily get to, you know, a wide wow. selection of music to go check it out. I, I'm going to have to look and see if Flim and the BB is on there. But at any rate, in the last seven years, I've been doing opera and classical. I love opera. I don't, I don't know how I can talk kids into loving classical because you either do or you don't i think you have to at least make it to a classical performance and close your eyes and experience the emotion of a great performance at least once to really begin to get it well but but you have to be blown away by something yeah you absolutely have to be blown away by something i, I was brought up with classical music and and have understood better how to do how to do um, opera in a modern way that works on laptops. So I'm particularly proud of that, wow. where we have a lot of cameras, students shooting the cameras. I get students to shoot because it's easier to train them into how to run a camera than training, you know, old, crusty porn photographers and running gun photographers and how to read a score or instruments of the orchestra. So we've had great luck with kids that's, learning how that's to. Funny. Uh, that actually reminds me, you talk about making classical listenable on a laptop, which is, that's a bold statement right there. But, um, and, and great that you're doing that. One of the well, things, I don't know whether we, I don't know whether we've done it, but well, I mean, we're, we're trying. So you got to try, right? You got to go look for the edge <laughs> of the cliff and, st and take yeah. one step further. But yeah. one of the things I noticed when I was going through this um, collection of music, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, uh, you know, uh, records from the '70s, particularly, is that I kept, I was listening on my laptop speakers, and I kept thinking, I was like, wow, I really hear the bass on this stuff. And I wondered if you wanted to comment on that at all. Is there something about well, you're well, the, the, my, my recording style, if it can be reduced to something, it's that you can hear all the instruments that are meant to be there. Yeah. Is I, don't, I don't go for one big hairball. Tom Bell at, at, uh, at uh, Sigma Studios used to do these great R&B records where he'd have vibes, roads, piano, something, 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 guitar, something, something, all playing the same thing. And it made a big, beautiful hairball. That's not my style. I love doing that, and I've tried to do it. I don't do it well. But I like hearing individual instruments. So the Little Feet record that I did in 89, um, uh, what, what was it called? Uh, let me see here. A Little Feet record in 89 was uh, Let It Roll. Okay. And the single Let It Roll doesn't sound very loud, but you can hear all the instruments, and they're in balance. It's kind of a, a, a acoustically inspired mix. It could have been crushed. Could have crushed it like Andrew Sheps and brought it up to plus a zillion. But <laughs> it's just beautiful and delicate, and some people like that. That's my audience. That's cool. Um, all right, well, so, George, I have a couple of questions from the rock stars. I reached out to, to some folks and got a couple back. Um, here's, a couple of, here's a question from Chris James. He wanted to know, uh, first off, what speakers do you rely on during your career, or did you rely on? Do you have any recommendations? Oh, that is a great question. That's a great question. For years and years and years, uh, I carried headphones, cost electrostatic headphones around Europe, and, <laughs> and then back to the U.S. When I got to uh, L.A., I, I was looking, searching for speakers. We did some records on Mitsubishi speakers. And then finally, Mick Zowski and I unboxed a set of Tannoys that were hiding in the back of Westlake, uh, SRM-10s, and, and started using these speakers that, that just sounded so much fun, you know, really puffy and big and had a hole in the mid-range for where you would normally have blare, and of course you'd EQ for that. So we made records that, that had presence. So for a long time, it was uh, Tannoy SRM 10s, SGM 10s. And around the time I did Lyle Love It, 92, 93, I started using uh, Genelex, uh, 80, I'm sorry, 2031As and 2032s, and then started using 
a little bit later, 8050s. I had 8050s along with ATC 150s at Blackbird. I still use 150s. I still use ATCs. I have 20s. These are ATC 20s behind me. Oh, yeah. Uh, But my go-to monitor is going to surprise you. Are all these headphones? These uh, I can take anywhere. They're incredibly high fidelity. They're they're planar, so they've got low end, except for the low octave. What's the, what's uh, the the brand on this? Audis A U D E S S E Audis. Okay. I think let me let me look it up. I don't want to spell it wrong. A U D E Z S E E Z. No, it's e- A-U-D-E-Z-E. Okay. A-U-D-E-Z-E. They're expensive. So, I mean, you know, your guys, and these are LCD3s. Um, so you don't give them to the drummer to go take out on the floor and track, you know, crank up their click drag through. If it's if it's Steve Gadd, I'll give him anything. anything <laughs> I once gave Stevie Nicks my good Sony headphones, and she promptly blew them out. Oh, that's a great quote right there. Um, all right. Now, how about, uh, here's another one from Chris. He wanted to know, what was the topology of the mixer you built in the 80s, and what did you use it on? The mixer that I built in the 80s was based on this op amp that I built. Very high speed. Good questions, Chris. Very high speed op amp. Had a fed input. Had a dual 50, uh, 5566 uh, and ran it hot. The input stage ran like five watts, you know, and this black box got hot. But I got all the voltage gain in the second stage, so I had an op amp that, you know, like when you turn something off, a, a, a Mackie mixer, you turn on and everything goes, right. this thing went from on to off. It faded out. It was so stable. And so I built mixers out of these high-speed op amps, and, and I blew a lot of them up. So I, I, I designed an op amp that was a little less high-speed. That's a but that's the basis of all of our analog designs now. It's the hybrid uh, uh, surface mount op amp that we built now. But the topology has basically always been the same, just just trying to optimize that op amp. And is a takeaway that uh, was true then and maybe true forever that for a truly ultimate design, it's going to require a lot of electricity or not? No, it doesn't anymore. I, I like some of these Class D amps, the, the Bruno Putzi's based uh, Channel Islands power amps and and they run cool. They're class D and and you've got to you've got to execute them well. But man, that's a great power amp okay. and goes out. To the no, I I don't think it has to. Well, you can. I I had Mac thirty five hundreds that I got from Hadley, and and they were at Woodstock. You know these big three hundred fifty watt tube amps. Mm-hmm. I turn them on and the neighborhood would dim. <laughs> um, and they they just uh, well you kind of you kind of need something to keep warm in Woodstock you know in the win- cold winters. I guess you do, but these were these were as impractical as as you could get. All right, so here so, are, here are a couple of questions from from Roger Nichols or Al, Roger Allen Nichols. And okay, he, he scared me. Yeah, I thought he, he'd come back. Great. No, 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 no. This is this is a Roger Allen Nichols is right here in Nashville, and actually both Chris James and Roger have been previous guests on the show as well. Okay. Roger wanted to know um, a pretty practical question. If you were to hire an intern tomorrow, knowing how many schools are cranking out, quote, audio graduates, can you tell us five things that you would look for in making your decision? It may be five is too many, but. No, no, because the first three are the same. Okay. Enthusiasm, enthusiasm, enthusiasm. I like it. The fifth one would be the ability to in any situation to tell the truth without necessarily having to blurt the truth out. To understand the truth nice. is essential. And actually, number one is somebody really has to pay attention. Yeah. Is the, is the whole thing with critical listening is, is paying attention. And that is every second you have to remind yourself that it's a gig. Every, every five seconds you have to say, okay, I've done this, I've done that, I hear the sound, what could I do to make this better? Every five seconds. Um, in listening, every five seconds, is there a new sound here? Is there a sound that's emerged? Uh, what am I listening to? It's the most fatiguing thing that I do. 
and something that most most new practitioners, interns, are not drawn to do. They're drawn to, well, I'm in a studio for music. I'm here for the music, man. No, dude, you're here to work. Yeah. You're, you're, here, you're here to hang. You know what, what Bruce Houdin called hang factor. You, you have to have the highest hang factor when you work with Bruce because he's going to work for 18 hours straight. Or as Stevie Wonder, see, Stevie doesn't, doesn't, he doesn't have the same clock as we do. Mm-hmm. He works 36 hours on, 20 hours off. So, wow. I mean, you've got, if you want to work with Stevie Wonder, you've got to hang and pay attention and not fuck up. There is that element when you are first doing this, if you want to be somebody else's assistant in that, you know, that kind of um, apprentice stage, you kind of have to put your who you are aside during that process and, and just be that other person that's teaching you. So those are my four rules of being, or here are my four rules of being happy in the studio. One is you've got to show up. Yeah. If you don't show up, it's inviting somebody else to take the gig. So you've got to show up. Two is you've got to participate. That doesn't mean opening your mouth all the time. The first three years in the studio, you're really not welcome to say anything. It's best if you don't say anything, but participate in the sense that you hear something needs to be done. You're on top of it. Yeah. Third, you've got to tell the truth. You, you, you've just erased a track. Say, oh, I, I hate to say this. But I think it's important for me to say it right now. I've just erased the lead vocal track in this spot, and we fix it. Would you like me to say it right now, or would you like me to write it in a postcard from my next location? <laughs> okay. Fourth thing is to let go of the outcome. This is not your record. It's the artist's record. It's a long time before you get to make your record. When you do, you'll appreciate the folks that work for you letting go of it for the same reason in the same way. Yeah. Let go of the outcome. That's And that's great. tough. That's tough when a mixer is in the studio for a day, you know, works all day on, on a mix and the artist is going to come in tonight. The artist sits down and says, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, maybe the artist reaches over and turns down all the faders on an analog console and you have to start again. Um, or maybe something you, you just worked hard on. They come in, they say, that sounds like shit. I, and we've had that. They said, what the fuck could you be thinking? That's not what I had in mind at all. So that, that happens to all of us. And man, you just got to lift yourself right back. You're in tears inside. You got to lift yourself right back up. Try to remember a good joke and carry on. That's great. Well, George, um, I think I might jump to uh, our final question, unless there's some of these jam Before session you questions do, you like. Yeah, go ahead. Before you do, that reverb is a Bricasti. I'll oh, the Bricasti. Okay, okay, great. Sorry, I missed that. I wanted to fill that in. Don't use, uh, oh, Lexicon. I I use Lexicon 960, and now PCM 96 is a lot. Yeah. I use use the plug, and it works really well. So, yeah, carry on. Well, I was going to, I mean, we've been, you've been generous with your time. We've been going for nearly two hours. Um, This is great. I'm loving it. Okay, good, good. Uh, I, I have a whole string of questions, but I can jump to the end. Um, and, no, let's do it. All right, I got time. Let's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll try and get through them then. Uh, when you started out in recording, what was holding you back? When I started out in recording, I was doing bank and car commercials. The studio that we had, we, we did music on the weekends, but during the week, uh, we made the money doing bank and car commercials. What was holding me back was only my imagination to try to hook up with better musicians to better to make better music. I thought the, I thought better recordings were made with better engineering. I didn't realize when I got into the business just how important musicians were. I mean, I found out soon enough, but call me crazy. I thought it was all in the processing gear. You thought maybe better recordings were all about having a, a bigger bank come hire you guys for that day? Uh, <laughs> no, the banks are cheap. No, but when you hear when you heard the Motown recording of that era, you heard these great sounds and you thought, well, I could do that with EQ with just about right, any band. Right. That is not the case. Yeah. It was not the case. It never will be the case. Because musicians are, are our gateway to heaven. And, you know, as you pointed out, working with great musicians requires a great deal of trust on their part that you're the right one to work with, which requires a great deal of patience on your part to stick and, around and, long enough to get invited to work on it. And Andrew and I kind of have the same response. Andrew Sheps and I have that same response. That anything that a musician wants, man, we're going to move heaven and earth to make that happen. We're there for the musician. Even if they're asking something which we might consider 
maybe not a good direction to take, you know, but uh, we'll try to figure out a way to do it. Yeah. I think that's important. Saying yes is important. We teach kids. You get out of here, you're going to get a job interview. You say yes. It doesn't matter what they ask you. You say yes. And the reason you say yes, you're not lying. You're saying yes because when they say, can you learn how to run an LCRS? Can, can you, do you know how to run an LCRS 22-2 system? You say yes because it's the wrong question. The right question is, can you learn how to run an LCRS system by Friday? And the answer is yes. So we tell our kids, always say yes because enthusiasm is important. Yeah. And if you have trouble, call us and we'll tell you how to get through it. Yeah, that's good. But, but say yes. All right. Well, I was going to ask for, you know, what was some of the best advice you received, but that might be the best advice all around is just say yes and be enthusiastic. I think, I think enthusiasm trumps. I hate to use that word. <laughs> uh, Funny so time. All. Um, how about sharing a recording tip, hack, or secret sauce, something that the rock stars could use on their next session today? The big thing, I think, is pay attention to phase. That's still something that's missed. You know, if if you're recording in a semi-live studio, listening to bass and drums, and there's a little bit of leakage in the bass, you'd be amazed at how much you can change the character of the bass. Of the bass, maybe it's a direct, but there's an amp in the room. Uh, how much you can change the character of the bass by changing the phase on the bass. Hmm. Just change the phase on the bass and see if you like the way the music's playing. Even if it's just a single channel of the bass DI, even just single reversing the, the polarity. DI. And because it's usually uh, a, a complex phase relationship in the room. Yeah. And, and, and you know, you have a choice. And, and I, I think what either Linda or George Lucas once, once said is choice is the enemy of commitment. You want to commit to a sound. You don't want to make all your choice, defer all your choices until mixing. But the idea with, uh, with uh, coming up with a great sounding track is my friend Ed Cherney's quote. Um, is George... Fill the speakers. You've got, you've got to fill the speakers. So fill them up, George. Fill the speakers. That's great. And sometimes it's easier to fill the speakers with fewer things than it is to fill them with many things. Well said. Well said. Uh, uh, how about a uh, hardware tool for the studio? Something, uh, maybe a favorite thing that you physical that you like to have with you on recording sessions or maybe just something cool you, that you've been checking out recently? Well, just the usual to have a have a good tuner on my iPhone, to have a, a BPM counter on my iPhone, because uh, I'm I'm counting tempo all the time, mm -hmm. making making a note of tempo through the tune. Because I don't always work with a click track. I, I want a, a drummer to set the tempo against vocal phrasing, mm -hmm. and so it'll move up and down. I just keep track of it, so I know between takes what I'll be able to edit together. Uh, piece of hardware, that's just mics, good mics. Good mics. A go-to mic would surprise you. It's an SM57. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that probably wouldn't surprise us on this show. No, no. it's still SM57, uh, SM7, SM7B, uh, Sanken CO100Ks, Sheps uh, MK4s, MK2s, MK4s, uh, Sennheiser E902. Have you ever measured a Sennheiser E902? It's got the ugliest frequency response you can possibly imagine. It's, it's like a 20 dB of gain at 7K. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it sure sounds good on a kick. That's funny. That's great. All right, now how about uh, software tools, something that's either a favorite or something you're excited about? I mean, you talked about your own plugins earlier. Maybe you should I'm, tell us about I'm those. Excited about, I'm excited about the new plugin, but I'm going to wait until it actually gets released. I'm going to send it to you. You're going to send me your, your Pro Tools. Okay, well, thank you so much. And I'll make and, sure to uh, make a video about it and all that. That'd be great. And, um, and, um, software, I, I, man, you know, I've, I've been through hell and back with pro tools, but I still like pro tools. I've mm -hmm. got an HDX system. Uh, I don't use a lot of different plugs. I use a lot of my stuff. Uh, I use, I use different effects on different things. Uh, software. I think it's worth students investing in fuzz measure. Fuzz Measure is in a little analysis program that can do good waterfall. And, and if you have a decent microphone, what you could call a reference microphone, measure what you're listening to. Hmm. I do a lot of measurements. I teach measurements. So what, measurements. what would that look like? If I was 
recording an acoustic guitar, would I have a mic to record the acoustic guitar with? But I might also. No, well, I'm I'm thinking more of, of analyzing your control situation. Okay, uh, all right. Doing a uh, doing a uh, impulse response of your listening room to see where reflections are. And hey, what's this little blip there? That's the glass. Well, what happens if I put a uh, packing blanket over the glass? Ah, wait a second. The imaging just got better. Yeah. Um, fuzz measure is a fairly inexpensive tool, very powerful. Well, when I was looking at my speakers, and I, I have a pair of NS10s, so nothing fancy, but um, I know how to make rock records on them. Yeah. And, and a console in front of those. In fact, um, George, the console that I have here is the custom built MCI that Jeep made for Studio C at Criteria. So it was no the same kidding. one that was in the 70s. Yeah, With the, the backwards faders? It has a backwards fader? Yeah, it has the, uh, no, they're not backward, but they are uh, the airplane style. And it was the oh, same one that was, was uh, Hotel yeah, California and the Bee Gees records. Yeah, yeah Pantons. Yeah. yeah, the Pantons. Um, but it's a it's a long console and, you know, some people may have a long table that they're putting their, their DAW on. And I noticed that if I put um, sound absorber panels right at the foot of the speaker coming down to where I was so that I wasn't getting a reflection off the console. It was like a, the 250 just lifted on the I response. used to do that. I used to do that. You know, the whole idea with Blackbird C was that when you got to the mastering step or the final mix step, that you could move the two wings of the console apart, the icon, and have nothing but you and the speaker in the room. Yeah. That, that, that's good. You're good. You're good. Uh, well, good. well I, I can't say that I pulled the panels out and mix like that, but it was interesting to see it at the time, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So let's see. Next up, um, um, business side of this. Do you have a resource that you want to recommend to people for, or, or any just advice on doing this for more than just a hobby? You've got to do your own marketing. You've got to do your own. So you've got to do social media. You've got to be out there. I have an assistant, Kazri, who's worked for me for 13 years with me. I know Kazri. And she's just brilliant. She's all the things, all the things I said, with enthusiastic and artistic and doing new things and always saying, yes, she's completely brilliant. So uh, she does our social media and, and keeps up with that. So you've got to do it these days. Yeah. Video, I, I would recommend that uh, everybody. Uh, keeps track of the fact that when you go on YouTube to hear a song, you have to remember that most of the world, if they don't see a video along with the song, they're gone in between two and seven seconds. Mm. Oh, they don't watch anymore. So video is really important. Having something visual up on your YouTube site, which is what's important these days in getting music out, because YouTube is the world's biggest provider of music. It's the second biggest search engine as well. It's a it's a huge resource, so you have, you just have to do it. And it's not hi fi yet, but I hope it will be soon. Um, so that's interesting. Yeah. So I guess there is good reason to believe that we could expect something like high fidelity audio from a place and like here, YouTube down the road. And here's what we're hoping for: is is some very good British researchers, Bob Stewart and Peter Craven, have come up with a way to stream very high resolution audio over 4824 transparent pipes. It's called MQA or Master Quality Assured. MQA, you can get MQA DAX and go on title masters right now and it will blow your mind hmm. how good these uh, old analog records are. We're listening to records in 192, 352, 384K and realizing that what very high frequency response gives us is better localization and a better sense of ambience, more localization, uh, more, um, more air. Yeah. More so, air. so that reminds me of a couple of questions I skipped over from Roger. One of them was this, uh, with the increase of access yet decline in presentation of music, in other words, MP3s, you know, how things sound on YouTube now, how has this influenced your decisions, George, as an engineer when recording a project? I don't. I go for the sound. I, I, I think any of us who you, who you ask that question to will say the same thing. We just have to go for the sound that blows their skirt up. Right. And then, and then we'll, we'll channelize it or we'll get Bob Ludwig to channelize it. Um, but I don't channelize it in my, my brain by saying, well, it's never going to make it out on the net or it's not going to work in a car. I want to, I want to hear, I want to have 
my heart lifted by what I hear. Yeah. Well, not to mention, as you just pointed out, that, you know, while we might be in a um, sort of like a um, a rut as far as what can be streamed and what we have accepted as what can be streamed, that's going to change. It should it's change. already changing. I'm telling you, Tidal is doing MQA now. You can get a, a $300 uh, a Voyager, Meridian Voyager Explorer um, and plug in the USB port of your computer and hear on earphones, at least. If you don't have good speakers, you have good earbuds. I, I carry anemotic research everywhere I go. Um, you can hear Tidal Masters, and there are, there are tens of thousands and more every day. I'm just stunning records in in the long history of records. That's great. Um, and not actually, only not only old, old my favorite's old Jody Mitchell, but uh, Deftones is is incredible as a rock record. That's an analog mix, so they put it up at 192. It's incredible. That's great. Yeah, I had my first exposure to listening to Tidal when I was out in Los Angeles just recently. A friend of mine had that the DAC set up, and he was streaming it, and it was. It was remarkable to hear records play it, back that way. It's gonna, it's gonna change. I think it's gonna change people's minds. I hope it will. I mean, we, we don't know. All right. So next question here: um, What file resolution should we record at for great sounding records? Highest, the highest you can record in. I'll try to record in one ninety two when I can. Big production, you know, forty fifty tracks, hundred tracks. I'm gonna have to go ninety six twenty four. If I have to go any lower than ninety six twenty four, I'll figure something else out. Hmm. If I'm, if I, I I don't want to go lower than ninety six twenty. I'd like to do more three eighty four work. You know, not a lot of tracks or a lot of mics, but I'd like to do acoustic music in three eighty four. I'd like to get back into Studio C and do some acoustic music with height. Yeah, five one and height nine one. I think that room is the place to do acoustic music in for for immersive, a really immersive experience. That's cool. Um, now, uh, oh, what was I going to ask? 32-bit file um, audio words versus 24-bit. This, this, this isn't well understood. In fact, 32-bit floats are really a 24-bit mantis and an exponent. For, for a storage format, for, putting, for printing something, um, the, all the files for uh, tune tracks, Superior Drummer 3, I did in 32-bit float at 192. Mm -hmm. took a lot of space. But we could change files, clip gain, and adjust files and recover them. In other words, if, if you adjust, if I do clip gain on a 24-bit file and then consolidate it or render it, I've lost resolution. Mm -hmm. I, if I do 6 dB, I've lost 2 bits of resolution. I'm a 1 bit of resolution, 12 dB, 2 bits. So... For certain things, you want to be careful what you choose. Generally, you know, since we optimize the level on tracks, you know, I'll, I'll go 24-bit. I'll go 192-24, 96-24. But for special circumstances where I'm going to do a lot of clip gain and I want to retain that, want to retain resolution, I'll do 32. There's no such thing as 32-bit audio. Right, it's okay. The maximum resolution is like 22 bits or so. We have a hard time even measuring it that much better. But does 32-bit, if we choose that in our DAW and, and our Pro Tools session, does that help th it um, crunch the numbers more cleanly or something like that when we're mixing? Only, only if we do this thing where in a 24-bit file, we reduce the resolution. If okay. we reduce the resolution, like if, if uh, the very input of your plug-in strip, you know, if you're working uh, HDX and native, no, this is different now. It used to be this way. But now you go in floats. Everything is 32-bit float. So mm -hmm. your plug-in chain is all 32-bit float. If you reduce, used to be if you reduce the resolution with your first plug-in, you were fucked for the entire chain. Mm. It's not so much that way anymore. But if you come in with a 20-board, if you come in with a 24-bit file, it immediately gets converted to 32 float in Pro Tools. You're working with 32 float in Pro Tools. Uh, that's interesting. Because, I mean, you know, it's sort of, Funny how the the DAWs will, you know, they're they're pro, but they're also pro consumer, you know, prosumer or whatever. And you know, here we have access to this tool for as a home studio that was once accessible only to a professional studio, and we get presented with decision making like that. You know, you you just like I just want to make a new song. I just want to call it, you know, 
Monday, 9 a.m., and you're already asked to choose all these things. And so it's great to hear that advice from you. So Rockstar's 24, 96, go for that. Go for 24, 96, and don't, don't do too much clip gain and then consolidate. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, let me jump to the final question with you, George. Cool. This one is hypothetical. We're going to go back. We're going to take the Wayback Studio machine. You're going to get to go back in time, find young George, tap yourself on the shoulder. You turn around and um, you say, what are you doing here? You say, well, I've come back to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What would you tell yourself? I've answered this question different ways, different times. I have to be careful because I don't know whether I would have taken this advice. Um, family, nothing is more important to me than family. Nothing's more important to me than my son. And um, all those years, wall to wall in a studio, I mean, I spent my first five years in Los Angeles and never went home. Uh, I made some okay records, but I think you have to you have to have you have to have a good understanding of your personal life and how much sacrifice you're willing to make and make sure your partner is on the same on the same wavelength. That's the big one. That's the big mistake that I made. And I don't know whether I'd listen to that advice. I don't know whether I I would have uh, given up on this girl that I married. I think it's always hard to know whether or not we can even handle our own advice or, you know, handle a lifestyle in the studio like that before we do it. And it's probably hard for anybody else to know if they could, what it would be like to, you know, be married to somebody with that particular lifestyle and see it coming. Cause I, I've also gone through a divorce myself and there's just, you know, to, I had to learn, I had to learn by family, well, how to, how to put family first. And nothing is worse than a divorce. Nothing, nothing in my life was worse than my, uh, divorces, first one more than the second. Uh, so I, I, I think that's good advice for kids is, is try to understand what you really want out of life because pe people forget, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned these records that I've done. That's great. But a lot of uh, the reissues don't have any credit on them. Hmm. You know, unless people remember that I did them, they'd never give me credit for them because it's, it's all, it's all gone. There's no, uh, allmusic.com is not as reliable as it used to be. Right. Well, George, thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. What an honor to have you here. Thank you for what taking a, great, a huge great chunk of time pleasure. out. Great pleasure it is to join with your gang and to say hi to everybody. I hope I run into every one of you next time I'm in Nashville or wherever you are in the world. That's great, and well, thanks. Yeah, thank you. And next time I'm at AES, I'll, I'll make a note to uh, look for you there and and come shake your hand in person. I'm there. Now, let me ask you one question, because uh, Elijah, I would pronounce it Lige. Hey, Lige, but you just said Lidge. Oh, Lidge, yeah. So this is the second time today. So uh, Lidge rhymes with fridge because I'm, cause I'm cool like that, which is the worst joke you've ever heard, <laughs> but now you'll never forget. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's great. So listen, if, if you have any follow-up questions that you need, just let me know. And I'd love to straighten things out. I'm, I'm, a little, I'm not a good presenter. I don't have linear, a good linear thought process to present these ideas. But you've asked great questions. Oh, thanks, man. Think, I'm glad you enjoyed it. That's really great. That's really great. That's really great. Send me the link. I will oh, do no, it's indeed. Oh, no, Rockstars. That's right. RSRockstars. RSRockstars.com. Yeah. So, Rockstars, we'll have links to everything we're talking about with George today in the show notes. You can find that, again, on your mobile device. Just click through or go to RSRockstars.com and search for George Massenberg, M-A-S-S-E-N-B-U-R-G. And we Good one. Will, you'll find it there. And we'll see you guys in the studio. George, can't wait to meet you in person. Thanks so much. Thank you, buddy. We'll do it soon. All right, Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. See you soon. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. 
and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.